So my name is Jeremy, and for 20 years at Stanford, I've been teaching a class called Virtual People. The class is about virtual reality, about how VR affects the mind, how VR is built technologically, and what the applications are. It's COM 166, and what I've done for the past two years is we've taught this class four times. We've taught it with about 600 Stanford students, uh, just about 600 students, and we've shared about half a million minutes together in virtual reality, okay? Everyone has their own headsets, they're in their own physical location, and we come together as avatars. Stanford professors need to decide their teaching schedule for the following year in March. March 2020 came around, and my colleagues were all figuring out how to learn Zoom and how to do shared documents. What I did is I volunteered to teach in the summer of 2021. No one wants to teach in the summer, right? That's when you go on vacation. I volunteered to teach in the summer because it was my hope that hardware and software and content would evolve well enough so that I could finally do what I'd been blathering about for 20 years, which instead of teaching about virtual reality, we're gonna teach inside virtual reality. And so we did a lot in those 15 months to make the most Herculean thing in my career happen. And when I say we, uh, as graduate students, you know how hard you work. And you know how when professors we talk about our findings, you're the ones doing all the hard work. And I just want to take a moment. These people worked so hard. And it wasn't just hours. They were innovating and they were solving really hard problems and they were dealing with medical issues and HR issues. It was, it was, it was a lot and they were incredible. First thing we had to do is we had to get some hardware. And so um, you might remember this from your time at Stanford. What I love about Stanford is when you ask a question, the answer starts at yes. And so when I went to the dean of h and I said, hey, can you please buy me a bunch of headsets? It's gonna cost about $100,000. They said yes. <laughs> Stanford bought me 200 virtual reality headsets. Each one cost about $400, we used the MetaQuest 2, and we used uh, the Pico Neo 2. Um, so we had huge stacks of headsets uh, that we had to snail mail to students all around the planet. You then have to choose a platform. And so to make VR work, if I walk this way in my physical room, you've got to see my avatar get better, bigger. If I point over here, you've got to see the directionality of that. If I'm going to hand you a document or a 3D model, all the physics of that has to work. So you have to choose a platform. And we evaluated lots of them. We ended up choosing one called Engage. And you can get a sense of what a scene looked like. This is a scene from a discussion section where my students are just interacting with each other as avatars. Um, how many of you have tried VR before? Raise your hands if you tried VR. Um, how many of you have tried it 10 times? about 1% of you. And so this is Popper, my grandfather, uh, and he uh, was 91 in this photo, and he did VR, and he said, all right, this is kind of cool, but really, what's the point? <laughs> what's the point? I, I don't understand. And what we're gonna talk about today is pedagogical materials and applications of VR that really earn the keep of the medium. So to design this class, we had to do something called flipping the classroom. And um, the way this class worked, it's 10 weeks, Every week was a topic, so we had a week on medical applications of VR, we had a week on education in VR, we had a week on ethics. And so for that one week, the topic stayed the same. On Sunday, they read articles about that week's topic, they had to do some writing. On Monday, we came together in a room like this, it was either on Zoom or face-to-face -face as the class evolved, remember we taught it four times, and I would just randomly ask students questions about the reading. So by the time Monday ended, they were experts in the topic because they'd done the readings and they were all prepared well enough to answer the questions. So they now know that topic cold, and on Wednesday, we would go on what I call a VR journey. A VR journey is something you could only do in VR, something that's incredibly special. You're doing dangerous things, impossible things you can't do in the real world. For example, uh, in the medical week, we went to a place called Allspace VR, it's a platform, and we were led by the Reverend Jeremy Nickel, the Reverend Jeremy taught us paced breathings. So we were together, you can see the screenshot there, you can see the other avatars. I could see my students, they could see me. Those platforms rose up to the point where we were in outer space looking down at the earth, experiencing awe, and then the Reverend Jeremy taught us how to do paced breathing and we did it together as a class. Now on paper, that sounds ridiculous. It just sounds ridiculous, but 
I'm a guy who's lived in California for 25 years. Everyone's been telling me since they meet me, I'm kind of hyper, I should meditate. I've never been able to do it. I've never been able to pull off pace breathing. Something about being in outer space, being around some people, but you're not being judged because you're not seeing their images, allowed me to do this thing in a way that I couldn't do before. So that's an example of a journey. Another example of a journey, uh, here's a screenshot from uh, Stanford football. And when a quarterback goes to the line of scrimmage, he's got to look around. He's got to read the defense, figure out if they're going to blitz or not, and then he's got two things he can do. He can kill, 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 go to the next play in the queue, or he can let it roll, keep the original play. He can also ask a running back to move. So all of my Stanford students got put in the head of Kevin Hogan, and they experienced this play. And so there were some football players in my classes, probably about the 20 or 30 of them. However, every other student in my class knows how to read a defense now. <laughs> they know how to change the calls. They embodied this. Other sports we did, so we worked the German national soccer team. My students know where to stand in the goal during a corner kick, with trained by the German national soccer team. Um, my students became Olympian in 2018. Every country gets three days on the mountain uh, in Korea. Everyone gets, every country gets three days. We convinced the, uh, the US coach to allow us to film a run. So all of my students got to uh, experience what it's like to be on that mountain and to train how to, to, to be skiers. So lots of sports training examples. Since 2003, I've been studying body transfer. So this is an old video, it's 20 years old. A person is walking around in VR and uh, he walks up to a virtual mirror. You're only gonna see about 20 seconds of this, but if you move your physical body for about four minutes and you see your avatar move with you, it, it, you move your head and it, you see the head move in the mirror, you move your arm and you see that, it really feels like it's your own body. It's called body transfer. You feel like it's you. So he now bends down, he was a white male, He's now a woman of color. And what we do in these simulations, and we've been studying this for 20 years, is we ask the question, when you become someone else and you have some experience that's designed to teach you about other people, could be different age, let me go stop that, could be different age, could be different gender, different body size, different species, how does that change the way you have empathy for them and how do you understand aspects of that? So my students spent an entire uh, week where they just became other people. And one thing that they did uh, in particular is called Thousand Cut Journey. This is the genius of a professor named Courtney Cogburn. Uh, it's a 12 minute experience where you become a black male Michael Sterling. You experience racism uh, as a child in elementary school, as a teenager during a stop and frisk scene, and as an adult where you're there for an interview and the interview doesn't even see you, doesn't even, uh, you don't exist to him. It's an incredibly powerful piece. And what I'm pleased to announce to you today, if anyone has an, a MetaQuest 2, uh, I can actually now share this with you. In other words, VR has got, now gotten so portable that not only did my students get to experience this, but we're about to release this for free uh, to the world. Uh, it's an incredibly powerful tool for thinking about systemic racism. Uh, and like you were saying earlier, we're building. We're building. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, when I say we, I mean Courtney Cogburn, my brilliant colleague. She gets the credit here. This is for Courtney. Yeah. In my class, so we're now back to... Uh, the schedule, so we just had our VR journeys on Wednesday. Now, on Fridays, we have small group discussion. And we've got these people who are coming together as avatars. And why Zoom doesn't work, and if you're in Zoom, and you're in that middle window, and it's a nine, nine, nine square grid, if one person looks all the way to the left, we kind of think that person in the middle is looking at the person right next to them. But they're not, they're actually looking off the screen, right? <laughs> uh, in VR, the spatial aspect of communication comes back. So one of the things we did, discussion sections lasted 20, 30 minutes. There were about 250 groups over the four classes. And in discussion section, we recorded every move they made when they leaned forward, when they turned their head. All of that was dumped to a file. So we recorded all of the movement. We can compute something called synchrony. Synchrony is the correlation of people's movements. So right now I'm looking at you, this group is incredibly synchronous. We are together, we are one. As I lean forward, you nod, and I've been feeling this this whole time. We can compute that as a success metric for conversation. And what's amazing about our data set is that we take in any given class, those discussion groups, those students don't know each other in week one. By week 10, they've now spent a lot of time together in, in VR's avatars, and we can ask the question, how do groups form, and how do they form at the millisecond level, at the minute level, at the hour level, 
and at the week level. So we're just starting to publish papers that answer fundamental questions about how people move their bodies, how they turn take, how they speak. And this is the largest data set in the history of VR by, by a few magnitudes of order because we have so much data of people coming together and we have outcome measures, for example, how well they did in the class or how creative they were. It's also the largest data set in the history of nonverbal behavior. Uh, there's not a ton of quantitative data on how people move their bodies in groups. And so what my students are doing now is starting to study how do people move, what does that mean, how can you predict outcomes like creativity. Uh, the final thing I'll say is uh, Ugi Han, who led this study, an incredible PhD student, she built 192 different rooms. And what she discovered is one thing that's never been studied in history is very large indoor spaces. And one of the largest findings from this class and study, if you have a four-person meeting and you got to have it in a room like this, the awe of the huge space causes all these downstream well-being effects. It causes restorativeness. It causes better synchrony. It causes more collaboration and creativity. But we've never known that because it's super expensive to put four people in a stadium. But in VR space, is free. So uh, one of the nice findings in this. So keep, keep in tune. We have a lot of papers coming out on this uh, amazing data set. And we continue to teach in VR. Thank you for your attention. Yeah.